Hello and welcome to the Herald Gaming Channel. Today, thanks to the kindness and generosity of my Patreons, I share with you my thoughts on the story of Whispers in the Dark, the first chapter of the Ice Brood Saga. Now, there are spoilers ahead, of course, so please do play through Whispers before you watch this. I would hate to spoil anyone's enjoyment of this first episode. And let's be honest, peeps, Whispers in the Dark has a lot to live up to, it kickstarts a new era for Guild Wars 2, so has it been the opening act we all hoped it would be? Well, for me, it's been a bit of a mixed bag because I think it had the potential to be so much more. So let's jump into it. The stage upon which our story plays out is a main character, just as important and appealing as our protagonist. So. The law nerd in me was very happy to be back in the reimagined yet wonderfully old school locale of Jorah's Marches. However, this chilly mountainous expanse was a little bit more compact and bijou than I was envisaging. That said, though, it's actually dense with content, has good verticality as well as, well, being rendered to perfection by the brilliant art team at ArenaNet. Bravo guys, a brilliant work as always. Now, in fact, considering the scale of the map, there is an impressive diversity of terrain. The forests feel ominous, the ruins are haunted, and the sense of cold is palpable in many of the regions, and, well, the light puzzles are rather fun. Now, that said, I was sad that Darkrim Dells is just a ruin. I hope in the later episodes we see its return to a proper full-fledged instance, old school style, but hey, we can but hope. The map meta boss is, well, a titch underwhelming, but the snowstorm event is great fun, with the frozen mechanic adding to the overall sense of threat and urgency to the event. The other map events too are enjoyable and very grounded in the narrative, with some being pivotal in the character development of our hero companions. But it's not just the heroes of the story that are making the maps a bit more awesome. The NPCs on the map too, with their dialogue, reinforce the ominous, foreboding story atmosphere. Now, to be sure, this is not the first time the writers have played head games with the non-player characters of Tyria, think back to the poor old Sylvari on Verdant Brink, having their collective noggins scrambled by Mordremoth, but I think this is the first time everyone faces that torture, and that is one of the strongest aspects of the episode, that invasive violation of self by the malevolent, omniscient Jormag. Which, for me, begs the question, how do you fight an entity that can reach into your mind and make manifest your nightmares? How do you strategize when your opponent is squatting in your subconscious, seeing your plans, feeding your fears, misdirecting your chain of thought? It remains to be seen just how omniscient and omnipotent this dragon god is, but finding a way to shield against its pernicious intrusion would be, well, number one on my to-do list if I were the master of my own destiny in Guild Wars 2. So let's talk about the story, because Jormag's ominous presence plays a big part of that narrative. We are called to Jorah's keep on our comms by Almora Soulkeeper, but we can tell something is not quite right. I mean, we go anyway, of course, because whatever bad thing is happening to her, well, we're going to be the good person happening to it. Now, the opening instant slash mini cutscene sees us surrounded by dead vigil soldiers, and then Bram finds a fallen friend he left behind after his misadventures with Jormag. Now, the keep is an open grave, not a living soul to be seen. The vigil leaders of Jorah's Keep, General Almira Soulkeeper and Javi Jorah's daughter, are not amongst the dead. We also find markings that indicate people have been dragged away, and suspecting that it could well be Almora and Javi, we 
give chase. Now, right off the bat, that terrible little voice is there too, whispering a sweet sickness into Bram's inner ear. The game does not mess about either. Jormag's influence is announced with a visual effect. I mean, there was a momentary question regarding the source of the voice. Speculation it could be the spirit of Raven. Jorah's Keep is surrounded by Raven statues and its magic is present from the get-go. So thinking that this entity is aiding us, well, it's a reasonable assertion. But sadly, we discover the truth in very short order. Honestly, I would have wanted this more drawn out with us investigating the map, uncovering facts and perhaps even being lulled or misguided into believing we are communing with the Raven only to be confronted with the terrible reality of Jormag's invasive power. But alas, too soon that mystery is solved and we're moving onwards in the hunt for the two vigil leaders. Now, the story devices for the episode are the Raven's Scepter and Lenses. Now, the scepter we use to activate and deactivate Raven warded areas on the map. The lenses Javi uses initially to channel visions to us, to lead us to her location. Now, this is a nice show, not tell method of conveying events that happen in our absence. However, it would be great if when story dialogue is playing out in the open world, other map NPC chatter is muted or turned down significantly. This kind of background noise can kill immersion and cause players to miss key story moments or be forced to read the text, you know, killing that immersion again. Now, Bram's interactions with his fallen guildmates and friends on our trek is well written and makes the hunt for the vigil leaders feel very grounded in the story despite being in the open world. Now, we do track down one of the leaders in short order again, too quickly and easily for my liking, but only after facing and this time killing another of Bram's former guildmates. So the visions led us to a captive but very alive Javi, however Almora's fate is unknown at this time. Upon rescuing Javi, she reveals what transpired at the keep and it's a harrowing tale. Every single male lawn in the keep was corrupted, seduced. By Jormag's promises of protection and power, the small price of their free will. They turned on their vigil brothers and sisters, cutting the throats of the night guard and lending the sons of Svani into the keep to massacre everybody in their sleep. No honor there. Javi tells us that the leader of the sons of Svani in the area, the Freni of Jormag, Jormag's chosen, was responsible for the unrelenting attacks on vigil soldiers and the atrocity at the keep. The Frenia himself had managed to steal some of Raven's power and had cloistered himself in the Raven's sanctum. Now, Javi and Almora had been working on a plan to gain access to the sanctum using the Raven lenses, but the keep was decimated and they were both captured before they could act. So, one leader found, one to go and our search for Almara takes us across the marches. We fight side by side with Bram, Ritlock, Cree and Jury, battling the sons of Svania. I mean, this is one of the most compelling parts as we watch real time as our friend's mental state deteriorates. It's especially distressing to watch as Jury relives the horror of losing her sister, Belinda and Bram is forced to face a vision of his dead father. It's rather dark stuff indeed. Now, we do eventually find Almora, and that's a good eventually. That eventually drew out the suspense and fear over her fate. But sadly, we are too late. Her body has been buried to a fashion, and I think there must have been something more which was cut from this episode, maybe, because Cree asks us to search the area around Almora's body for clues to see if there's any traces of Bangor or the other char he led north. She wants to know if Bangor had been there for her at the end, speculating that he was the one who took the time to bury her. But there's nothing to find, nothing to see in the small area where she fell. Did they cut 
content here or is this a setup for the next episode? <sighs> Time will tell, but Almora Soulkeeper, the founder of the vigil, a hero who has been at our side since the launch of the game and her death is a sad little side note. No cutscene to send her off, no fanfare or flourish, just a sword and a plaque in a small keep at the edge of the world. What a disappointing end for such a stalwart and courageous char. She deserved far better than an off-stage death. But our story does not end with her demise, for we now have Almora's raven lens and are ready to break into the raven sanctum to face the Frania. Now, the raven sanctum itself is a maze of sorts with a few simple puzzles you need to complete to progress through the story and unlock the final encounter. A friendly word of advice, if you haven't done this, why are you listening to my video, but do bring some bar breakers to speed along this meeting and a gap closer if you have access to one as well. Now, upon defeating the Freni, because of course we would, we are so awesome, we're gifted with this charming cutscene. No. You. You still hear it too, don't you? Let me help you. Champion. It's time I treat you with the respect you deserve. Speak face to face. That voice. The air is thick with change. I feel it, even as I dream beneath the ice. Jormak. You fear me as you feared Kral Katori. That is natural. But ice fortifies. Ice protects. All this war. All this pain. Aurin wants to end it. And I can help her. I want to help her. Terrible things lurk just beyond the horizon. But you can bring eternal peace to our world. In time, you'll realize you made me. And when you do, I'll be waiting. Commander, about what Jormag said, we're not gonna take it seriously, right? Right. Wow, that's all kinds of creepy and it's an interesting offer, and our character, despite their protestations to the contrary, seems to be a little bit tempted. And oh dear, <laughs> because better the devil you know is, oh it's never better, easy is the enemy of good and right. And it's almost laughable, John Mag marionetting a cop so else warning of darker threats than him. I remain unconvinced, and if I got a vote, Ooh, this would be a hard pass for me, but story-wise, this is one of the strongest moments and I look forward to where this dark path leads us. Poor choices make great narratives and our hero looks to be stumbling onwards towards a sea of morally ambiguous options. At least that's my hope for the future. So, my conclusion. All in all, the story was enjoyable, but... Oh, like with the death of Joko and the resurrection of Aurene, the story is let down by the rush to a conclusion. What we got was enjoyable, but the first episode of a grand saga, which we were told would be bigger and better and stronger and faster than the living world patches of Path was... Well, it was a bit underwhelming, wasn't it? And that's sad because there was so much potential in this opening chapter. Raven spirit and its lord, the hunt for the vigil leaders and the mental deterioration of our guildmates, 
but we seemed only to skim the surface of the possible. Raven's influence is a footnote, offering no insight into the spirit at all. No secrets, no forgotten lore or history, just a boon and a beacon and a ward fob. Perhaps they will build upon this in the next episode, because although I appreciate the buffs, thank you there, and the animation of the bird is beautiful, but we were promised so much more in respect of the spirits of the wild. The cognitive decline of our guildmates is a high moment, narratively speaking, of course, not wishing ill on anyone, but I wanted to see more. I wanted us to join them. Where are our visions? Have we not lost many friends in battle? Many loved ones died ourselves? What of our pain and fears? Where is our haunted moments? Also, I would have been interested in having more interactions with our hero companions about their visions and whispers. Because the more we know about our friends, the more they confide in us, the more secrets they share with us. Sharing their fears, their past, their hopes, the more we care about them and trust them. And the worse the betrayal is when it all goes peep tong. Dun dun dun. Okay, but now this all might sound overly critical, but it comes from a loving place because I think Guild Wars 2 has the potential to be the best MMO on the market. And the game designers just need to be given the time and freedom they need to challenge us as players. They should not be afraid to make content and story that takes time and effort to complete. There is a happy medium to be found which allows the story to play out in a meaningful way that also respects gameplay. It can be done, I believe, I believe. So let me know in the comments your thoughts on Whispers in the Dark and if you agree with me that the story team should be given more time to express the narrative of the saga and do whilst you're down there please like share subscribe ring that bell so i don't disappear into the storm and get eaten by joe mag and do please show some love to shane jones cody kildare carl nelson jason vanta cub jolly joe star molini dark griever and all my wondrous fantabulous patreons without whom i would be unable to dedicate the time and resources i do to my content creation i can never thank you all enough and if you would like to join my merry band of Patreons to gain access to my private Patreons parlor discord, early access to my content and chatters with me for what that's worth, there are links below. Now I hope you will join me again very soon for more Guild Wars 2 goodness. I see more top 10 Fashion Wars videos in our future. Oh yes I do. But until then, as always, thank you so much for watching.